Hello. Um, well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure for Flatham House to be working on this project. I have a lot of slides, so I'm hoping <laughs> um, there's going to be quite a bit to look at. Um, and I thought to, to, to give a little bit of context on, 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 my, on my talk, I would give a little bit of background of where I'm coming from in my practice. Um, so I may have to sort of stand with my hand like this because I've got so many slides. I, I graduated from the Royal College of Art some time ago and um, I went on to tutor there for four years and I'm currently a cross-department tutor there and I work at Chelsea as well. Um, and a lot of the students, I do classes at Flat Time House with them. I then went on to work at, at a place called Wising Arts Centre in Cambridgeshire, which is a site for research, uh, for artist practice and residencies. And I worked there for, for nearly five years, uh, programming retreats, workshops, um, and uh, this, the, the farmhouse where artists would live. We worked with artists such as Gustav Metzger, who was a contemporary of John Latham's, uh, worked with him on the Destruction and Art Symposium in 1966, and he stayed with us for six months in 2014. Um, this is one of the exhibitions that I made there, which looked at antiquated projections on the future, and another show which included work by John Latham, which was really my introduction to John Latham's work, uh, research introduction, um, called um, uh, the Starry Rubric Set, which looked at pseudo-scientific models of space and time. Uh, this was an associated program I made with the artists Ed Atkins and James Richards and Gil Young, and used a, f a phosphorescent surface as the basis for the projection. So the, the screen itself held the light from the project from the projector. Um, and this was a project I did with the industrial noise band Maria and the Mirrors, uh, who I introduced to the American artist Karen Sitter. And they collaborated on this um, multimedia installation, which was shown at the Institute of Contemporary Arts on the Mall. Uh, then went on to do a lot of music programming. This is the music festival I used to do for Wising. Um, and when I went independent, continued that with. Dalston Music Festival, Experimental Music Programming, collaborations with artists, such as this one with Beatrice Olabarrieta, um, exhibitions, like this one with Agata Medeska and Coco Crampton, and more recently, uh, an exhibition that was based on my thesis, uh, I wrote about boredom, and this was at Nilo, the Contemporary Arts Centre in Reykjavik, uh, included a work by um, a new iteration of the work by John Baldessari, I will not make any more boring art, uh, where the students of the Icelandic Art Academy wrote this across the uh, gallery walls for the whole duration of the show. Um, so, after that brief introduction, hopefully brief, um, I'm going to move on to what I'm here to talk about at the moment, which is the institution Flat Time House. Um, and Perhaps a little bit of that cross-discipline kind of background will help understand my place within this institution. So I started working for Flat Time House in 2015, and I work as the curator and the director of the space. Flat Time House is a very unusual institution in that it's a house museum, but also a contemporary art space. It was the home of the, as, as Orietta already introduced the home of the radical, um, very experimental and often in his lifetime overlooked artist John Latham. And um, John was born in 1928 in Maramba, Zambia, what was then um, Livingston in northern Rhodesia. And he Moved to Britain as a young boy to boarding school. He joined the war effort uh, for World War II at the age of 19, 
uh, became a captain in the Navy, uh, saw two of his ships sunk uh, whilst he was still on board, and was also involved in the recapture of Italy. Um, whilst in Italy, he saw uh, an exhibition of the stolen works, uh, the, uh, the, the works that Mussolini stole in Rome, and in front of this El Greco painting had this revelation that he wanted to be an artist. Um, one can only presume the trauma that he'd been through must have kind of helped um, come to this conclusion. Um, he came to Britain again and studied at Chelsea, and after a long career, moved to this house in 1985 in Peckham in South East London on a residential street. It's quite an unusual location. Um, so it remained 210 Belden Road for most of that time, but in 2003 he renamed it Flat Time House after his personal cosmology of flat time and he declared it a conceptual sculpture and anthropomorphized the space and dedicated each of the rooms the attributes of a different part of the body. So in this plan, in small type, I'll read it for you, it says uh, the face, the hand, the brain, the body event, and the hand. So the face is the most striking aspect of this building when you first come across it on the street. And it's a book sculpture that is cantilevered through the piece of glass supported by the plane, by the pain um, of this large, these two large books with the pages interleaved. The next space is the mind. Then there is the, what is essentially an office space and, and house the archive. This is, this he dedicated the brain. A corridor space called the shift. Then this room here, which is obviously a kitchen and a living area, um, which a lot of people don't expect when coming into the house. Uh, this he called the body event. Then at the rear of the building, under the skylight, what used to be his studio, uh, which he called the hand. And uh, at the back, we also have some studios uh, where artists work uh, in the garden. So the, the spaces, as you saw them there, aren't what they looked like when John Latham lived there. Um, the space has changed a lot. And this is partly because John Latham was someone who didn't believe in the notion of heritage. He thought of the world as constantly changing. He considered the, 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 the universe in a way that was based on time rather than space, and he thought that nothing was static. And so it's logical that it, it would be contradictory to hold the place as a time capsule. So there you can see the hand in 2005, this was the living area in 2005. You can see it's quite messy. Uh, it's obviously lived in. This was his workstation in the corridor. And you can see here this is the hand as a studio space. Um, these are actually quite useful when we're doing conservation work because we can find materials on the shelves and see exactly what paints we're using. Um, so, Rather than this being a museum of John Latham, uh, Flat Time House is really a museum of his ideas, and it operates a conceptual space, um, which hopefully you might begin to understand as I continue. So the Mind Gallery, when John Latham lived there, well, for, rather for the last three years of his life, from 2003 to 2006, he selected four works to put in this space and he set up a little camp chair and he would sit in this space and talk to anyone who came in um, about his ideas and he would try and convey this cosmology, this so far confusing perhaps to you notion of flat time. Um, and people would come around the world in in our archive, we've got correspondence with figures such as Noam Chomsky, uh, Stephen Hawking, with popular musicians such as Pink Floyd and John Lennon, 
and with uh, classical musicians such as Owen Laszlo. Um, and, and so he, as well as many obviously artists in conceptual art, um, and so he really had a broad area of interest and would discuss these ideas with many people. Um, and so we still have these four works on display um, and we keep them there almost as learning aids or, or teaching tools um, as John did. And um, I often have to do this introduction to flat time because people don't know what it is. John Latham's known as a very difficult artist. He's, um, that's partly because of the way he used to talk about his work. He didn't believe in rational forms of communication. He wanted people to think for themselves. And so really to understand his work, you need to understand the language of his artwork. And when you understand that language, then it's easier to understand what he's trying to convey intuitively. So, as I go on, if some of the things I, I'm talking about don't make sense, don't worry about it. Um, and, um, and also, I, I always like to kind of give the caveat that if John Latham was listening to me talk about this now, he would almost certainly disagree with me and say that I was uh, explaining this wrong. I'm also, there's an inherent contradiction that I'm rationalizing something which is intended to be understood intuitively. And if John Latham was still alive, these ideas would have changed. Um, he was refining these ideas all the way through his life. Uh, recently, gravitational waves were discovered and John Latham always suggested that that would never happen. Now that they've been discovered, he would have changed some of his ideas to reflect this. So, um, this is a work that he made in 2003 with the purpose of, um, of, of communicating this. And we have two planes. On the left, there is a plane of glass, and on the right, a white plane made of foam board. And this is where it's useful to understand the language of materials from John Latham. So John started using glass in 1987. This is uh, a controversial work called God is Great, which uses glass, uh, the Bible, the Torah, and the Quran. Uh, this is a work called They're Learning Fast, which is a piranha tank. Uh, with live piranhas, and this is another God is Great work, uh, which is in the Tate collection. And for John, glass is a material that is symbolic. He always uses materials in a symbolic way, and glass is symbolic of nothing. So um, that might seem a little bit odd to have something that is symbolizing nothing, but for, for John, um, this is very important. When he was referring to nothing, he was referring to no time and no space. And this also equates to the atemporal, that which is outside of time. Um, so if you keep that in your mind for one moment, I'm now going to talk about the white plane. For John, he called this the least event. So you can think of this as being the shortest duration that there can be. So again, this seems theoretical and um, there can always be a shorter duration, but within theoretical physics and high-energy physics, um, there are actually definable and measurable shortest durations. And uh, the duration which uh, Latham found interesting and useful was the Planck time. The Planck time is a unit which is um, the duration it takes for a beam of light to cross the diameter of an electron whilst in a vacuum. This is a very, 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 very short duration. Um, and when, when things are operating on a duration less than a Planck time, we move out of the realm of general relativity and into quantum physics, where things can be simultaneously in two places at once and can move in time from the future to the past. 
So times we understand it as something going in one direction doesn't operate anymore. So any durations over a Planck time are in the realm of general relativity and as such are in a realm that humans can understand subjectively. As the, does this make sense? Yeah. It's reassuring there's a, there's a few people nodding. Um, you, you may understand this much better than I do, actually. Um, so what we have on the left is nothing, and on the right, a very, very small something. So then it's interesting and useful to think of what John Latham's model for the universe, that he, the model of the universe that he ascribed to. And he ascribed to a cyclical universe, uh, what's often called the Big Crunch Theory, whereby the universe comes from a big bang and expands, 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 comes to a point of maximum extent and then begins to, 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 to compress. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller till it gets to a non-dimensional point. There is another big bang and you get a new universe. So rather than the big bang being a point in which everything comes to existence, is rather a transition point from one state to another state. So then the glass plane becomes more interesting. Rather than it being a nothing before something, it is a transition point between two states. So as well as being no time and being the atemporal, we can think of it as being a transition point, a paradigm shift from one universe to the next, or John Latham would also think of this as from one mode of understanding to another mode of understanding. Um, so this he thought of the Big Bang being obvious, an obvious uh, paradigm shift. Another would be when Einstein wrote the theory of relativity, where one understanding of um, the universe went to one side and a new unified model came around. Uh, within the history of science. Within the history of art, he saw a relationship between um, developments in theoretical physics with developments in contemporary art. And he saw Robert Rauschenberg's white monochromes in 1951 as being kind of white nothing in the centre of the 20th century, similar to um, Hawking's black holes or um, Einstein's theories. And in his, his own art, he saw a paradigm shift occurring in 1954, and that is when he made his first spray paint work. So before this, he'd been working very painterly style, very flat paintings, uh, influenced by El Greco. And um, with this new technique, he found that he was able to, to impose a lot of his ways of thinking into the actual making of the work. Um, so previously, he had seen a disconnect between what he had been, he'd been trying to, to deal with conceptually um, and the expression this was finding, the, the way he was communicating this. And his main influences were two scientific figures. Um, Clive Gregory, who was an astronomer and the, the founder of the University of London Observatory, and his partner, Anita Cozen, who was a, a psychologist and some, sometimes described as a parapsychologist, an animal behaviorist. So really interested in the outer limits of psychology and its relationship to science. And they had developed a, a theory that they described, uh, that they named O-structure, which was an attempt at a unifying theory of the universe. This was one of a number of kind of theories around this time. Um, again, I often think that this is down to um, the horrors of the Second World War, potentially trying to, to find um, limits to rational thought and unifying models for how to go forward. And John Latham had been discussing with them a a universe based on time rather than on space. Um, when they asked him to do a mural for their house in 1954, rather than doing it in his painterly style, he decided to use 
uh, a spray gun that he'd been using for work in the garden and made uh, one of his first murals. This isn't a picture of that mural, but a work around the same time called For Mission. And um, for him, suddenly, the making of the work itself became an event. And so the, 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 the practice was becoming um, the ideas that he was dealing with. The, the points of spray are almost like moments in time. Um, and so for the work that we have on display at Flat Tone House, this is called Organism Somewhere. And if you look at this detail, you can think of this as this instantaneous work, this least event, this short duration, but also potentially aesthetically as a, it, this could be the, the entire universe in negative, it could be the tiniest particle under a microscope, or it could be an organic structure. And you can see that he's used his thumb to kind of move this, to kind of introduce a human presence within the work. So then we come to the, the third work in, in this series in the first space. And this is um, a work called the Book Relief Triad, or sometimes the Karamazov Triad. Um, and this is more akin to the, the type of work that John is most famous for. And these are his book relief sculptures, where he uses books cut in half, burnt, covered in plaster, and stuck to canvas, uh, sometimes in a sculptural manner. And books are incredibly important for John Latham. Um, because of the way that they can be made into events. Um, just going to go back. For him, the book is a symbol for received opinion. So um, you can think of the book as a receptacle of knowledge. And John wanted people to challenge received opinion. And the influence that this had on a lot of artists is an image by the work uh, John Stazecker. He saw a work at the Tate when he was a young boy by John Latham, uh, still in the collection, this work, Film Star. And when he went to see this work again, he'd seen that it was a different colour. And this is because John would used to go to the space and change the pages of the book. And so when he had this realisation, um, he, 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 he always says that this was like a revelation on what you could do with art. Um, and so these books contain this uh, time, this event nature, but also are a receptacle of received opinion. And John was quite radical in his um, questioning of this. Uh, this is a statement from when he was teaching at Central St. Martin's. Senior academic institutions have been defrauding the public and students for 300 years. They're not concerned with education, still less with the truth. They're run for the benefit of the staff. He was saying that as a tutor. And with this work here, which is one another famous work of his called Art and Culture, Spit and Chew from 1966, he got his students together and took the book Art and Culture by Clement Greenberg out of the library. At this time, this book was really a kind of tome on, on how to make good art, essentially. And at St. Martin's, that was a particular, um, as the home of Anthony Caro, who was championed by Greenberg, this was quite a controversial statement because he got the students to tear out a page of the book each, uh, eat it, and then spit it out into a vial uh, then John Latham, using an enzyme, who put that in the vial with all of this spit and gunk and pulp, then distilled the spirit of this and created a pure spirit of art and culture from that, uh, which he then returned to the, the library and promptly lost his job. Um, so you can see that his acts were deliberately provocative and um, perhaps one of the more provocative works are, are his scoop tower ceremonies, where he would take 
towers of books, usually the Encyclopedia Britannica, as a symbol for all received opinion, hierarchical forms of knowledge, and uh, burn them, usually in symbolic spaces, such as outside the British Museum, uh, outside Senate House. And this is seen as obviously a destructive act, but for John Latham, I think, if rational thought is leading to the horrors of the Second World War, you can see that there is a space to question received opinion. And this isn't a rejection of all knowledge. He would often cite different authors and philosophers specifically and their importance to him. But rather, he is suggesting that we just don't take this blindly. So we can see the face of Flat Time House in this kind of knowledge of what the book is for John Latham. Here, the pages of the book are interleaved, which means that you can't read the book. So he's rejecting uh, a, a logical, rational reading, and we need to approach it in an intuitive way. So then to come back to, with that knowledge, to come back to the, the Karamazov triad, and we can see that there are three books. Um, and they symbolically relate to the figures in Dostoevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov. There's three brothers, Mitya, Ivan, and Alyosha. The elder brother was very instinctive. The middle brother was very rational and scientific in his approach. And the younger brother was very intuitive. And for John Latham, he was interested in these models as um, the ways that humans behave within society and the ways that, that they relate to um, all external influences. So we can think of these as being the uh, instinctive, as being needing to eat, sleep, excrete, uh, all the bodily requirements that a human has to procreate, to keep the species going, everything that comes from the oldest parts of our brain. And we need to do these regularly on a daily basis. Then there is rational thought. If you're existing purely based on instinct, then you probably wouldn't be received well in society. And rational thought is the uh, kind of the ability to communicate, to, to, to formulate thoughts and to explain them to someone else, to have a conversation. Bureaucracy, paying your taxes, operating within society in a way in which others can also exist. And for John Latham, this is a longer time base. This, is, this, is, takes, this requires consideration of uh, more things than just purely how to stay alive till tomorrow. Then what he thought was neglected in society was what was symbolized by um, the uppermost canvas, that of Alyosha. And this he thought of as being what he called reflective intuitive thought. And this was something he thought was the, the longest time base. Um, being able to, to think purely outside of what is benefit to yourself. And this he saw as being similar to um, creative practice. And he saw art as fitting in this kind of area, um, perhaps alongside uh, experiences such as Zen. Um, and this was something he thought was neglected within society. He didn't like to use the term artist. He, he devised a term called the incidental person because he thought this mode of thought wasn't purely available to artists and that everyone in society was able to think in a reflective, intuitive manner, but often it wasn't used. So I'm gonna to come to the fourth work in the space now, and this is the time-based roller. So this is an activated uh, kind of mechanical kinetic work and John thought of this as a, a score for the universe and in this work it brings together the ideas from the other works as this kind of uh, diagram of three different modes of time so it's quite small here but what you have is uh, on, on an electric switch, a roller across the top which activates and pulls the canvas 
uh, upwards. Across the top of it, you've got a number of letters, A, M, P, Q, R, U, Z, uh, on a board with a barrel upon it. And there's also spray on the front of the canvas, which you only see at the barrel of the, uh, the mechanism. We can see the reverse, through the reverse of the canvas, the front of the spray. Um, so, alongside we have this kind of diagram in, in, in John Latham's very difficult language that uses pure mathematics and language from physics. We have this explanation that's very hard to understand. Um, but you can see from this work, this 1972 work that's at the Tate, um, when it's activated, the canvas goes up and down and up. And so what you have is a model of passing time, time as we normally understand it, something that goes forwards, something that's always progressing. But then you also have another model of time which uh, I have been hinting at whilst I was talking about the Karamazov triad, and this is um, the time base. And this goes from the shortest duration, the least event, so if you remember the white plane, um, the Planck time. So at A, you have the shortest duration in the universe, um, and then as you go along, you get longer and longer and longer durations. To get the middle, this is point M, this is the shortest, perceivable, uh, shortest duration perceivable to a human. So he would think of this as uh, 30th of a second. You can think of this as similar to um, a frame rate for a cine camera, 24 frames a second. If it goes over this, you can see the individual frames. If you go below this, it's just constant movement. Uh, sorry, vice versa. Um, and then as durations get longer, you get to point P. So this is instinctive behavior. You get into the realm of human experience. So this is needing to eat every day and etc. This is just staying alive. So this is the time base in which humans operate on an instinctive level. And then as you move along to Q, this is rational thought. This is like a generation, 30 years. This is thinking about um, the, the, the medium term. Um, consideration of not just what's going to keep you alive, but what is good for society to an extent. This is government proposing certain things to a populace, them deciding what they want, and then selecting a political party based upon that. Um, this is how society operates in most occasions. And then the longer duration that he thought was neglected, that of reflective, intuitive thought. Um, beyond that, we get U, which is the duration that the universe has been in existence. And then beyond that, point Z, that is off the canvas. And that is the duration of the universe at maximum extent, or all possible universes. So you can think of this as being, this is on the barrel outside the canvas. So you can think of this as being like the glass plane. This is the nothing, this is outside of time. It's atemporal because it's constantly behind the canvas. Is this still making sense? Still with me? Okay. So, um, I mean, so far, um, no, what I'll do now is maybe just a quick run through of the house so it kind of makes sense. Because what you have here is a symbol for received opinion, which transitions through a glass plane, which you can think of a symbol of a paradigm shift into this space, which is the mind, a symbol for, uh, of reflective intuitive thought, which depends upon the brain, which is a space of rational thought. And then that's dependent on the body event, the symbol for uh, instinct, because if you're purely rational without instinct, you'll just die. Um, so this so far seems quite um, esoteric, um, it seems quite eccentric, but what is maybe surprising to understand is that there, are, there have been actual real-world applications for some of these ideas, and 
um, some of his ideas have already affected government policy and for some time during the 1970s he was directly working through the artist placement group that he founded with his partner Barbara Stavini or rather Barbara, Barbara Stavini founded and John Latham was a founder member um, they worked directly with the British government for some duration in the 1970s um, so one of these before I get on to the artist placement group one, one thing to kind of think about here is what, what applications could um, long durational thinking have on society and John saw the position of the incidental person as being someone that was able to operate within uh, areas of society thinking in a rational manner and perhaps bring up possibilities that or questions that wouldn't otherwise be able to be raised uh, an example of this is this work which it's difficult to perhaps for some people to understand as an artwork but if you you think that John Latham wasn't really interested necessarily in making artworks but rather trying to convey ideas um, this is essentially an engineering project uh, and he made this work in 1972 and it was remade successfully in 1973 uh, originally at Gallery House on Exhibition Road um, where the Goethe Institute now stands was for one year an incredibly experimental space and what you see here is a bellows on top of a chamber of water um, so this is the bellows when it was originally situated inside the building um, and flooded the basement on that occasion um, and this is when it was situated outside being constructed and you have a nine meter tall structure with a one foot diameter cylinder containing seawater and John Latham proposed this for a model for capturing wave energy from the sea so he was imagining there being kind of offshore farms of these um, so essentially a mode to, a, a way to capture wave energy which has only recently become a viable um, form of power generation um, he was interested in the fact that this bellows made this sound so it almost operated as a musical instrument and for him this is well really we can see this as a kind of uh, a way of understanding for him this breakdown between art and science and his lack of interest in aesthetics for their own sake but as a, mo a way of communicating ideas um, I'm going to move on to another project this is a work by John Latham called The Five Sisters this is a found land artwork so this is the deposits from the shale extraction industry um, in the lowlands of Scotland and in the mid 70s John Latham was on a placement with the Scottish government or at the time uh, the Scottish office so what the artist placement did was work with artists directly talk to industrial companies such as British Steel and ICI place the artists with them they would get a salary directly from um, the company they would have access to materials modes of making and the idea was that they would be able to show new ways of working with materials that the company hadn't developed so with ICI, uh, Jeffrey Shaw developed these ways of making inflatable sculptures. Um, John Latham had a placement with the Scottish office and had recently been working with uh, the coal board and the aerial photography department of the British government. So this occurred at a time when the artist placement group pivoted from working within, working within industry to working with, directly with the British government. So they were thinking about how these ideas can directly affect governance and the way that people live in society. Uh, Tony Benn, the Labour politician, was a huge supporter of the APG. And uh, when John Latham was working with the Scottish office, they wanted to work out what to do with these eyesores, these huge waste heaps. Uh, John Latham suggested 
that using his ideas he suggested that these are time bases of accumulation and etc and etc but essentially what he said was that these were best dealt with by leaving them there and so they became registered heritage monuments um, this is another one called the Nidri Woman uh, this is another work by John Latham uh, this is you can see the scale here the 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 houses scale uh, huge mountains and this is a document of the Five Sisters work uh, that's in the Tate collection. Um, so an, another idea of this is because they work with many artists in placement um, the artist Ian Breakwell was placed within the Department for Health and he was working at Broadmoor Prison. Um, the evaluation of his project that he wrote is still under the Official Secrets Act because what he did was highlight the terrible conditions in which people were being held in, uh, which at the time were seen as standard within uh, the prison uh, the, the complex, and, and by an outsider being positioned within that, raised the fact that this was um, not uh, the, the correct way to do things. Um, I think I'm going over time, so I may go a little bit faster, but in 1976, John Latham was invited to be part of Documenta uh, 1977, John Latham was invited to be part of Documenta 6, and through Joseph Boys began working with the West German government and discussing ideas of how to, to implement incidental person approach within their bureaucratic structures. Uh, this was a presentation of that project in 1978 called the Government of the First and Thirteenth Chair um, and this was actually the same work performed uh, in 2012 at Wising Arts Centre um, when I was the curator there. So we recommissioned this work to make this again um, and re-performed it um, in the exhibition space. This was um, very useful for me because it helped me understand so much of John Latham's ideas and it's an incredibly important work because it's his way of via performance of communicating this very uh, complex idea of placing artists within government. Um, so I'm just going to come to an end soon um, because I wanted to, 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 to talk about briefly um, Flat Time House now and how Flat Time House operates. So Flat Time House has been an institution since 2008 and here we have an image of the artist Lord Provo working with John Latham. Um, she was John Latham's assistant at the end of his life and she became one of the first artists in residence who actually lived in John Latham's house in his, in his bedroom, lived in the house itself and then made an exhibition within the house. So the way the house operates is that its artists live in the space, the whole house is used as an exhibition space and as a research space and as a studio. Uh, Law went on to, to win the Turner Prize and is representing France at Venice uh, next year. Um, other artists who have lived in the house are, are Rory Pilgrim, um, we also worked with uh, Mark Mishanovitz, who was a contemporary of John Latham, who also did work at Gallery House in 1971. And you can see here, uh, transformed the house, carpeting it, and uh, including his glass collection, painting all of the walls. And so the house is non-static, it constantly changes. It's not like a typical heritage space. I uh, also recently worked with uh, the German artist Lena Hermsdorf, who worked with a performer in the space. Uh, this was in collaboration with Kunstler House Bremen and she installed a large sheet of reinforced glass which bisected the house and included this uh, work from John Latham's residency placement in Clare Hall Hospital. These are x-rays of his body. Um, this is the same work at Flat Time House. It included a computer controlled sound installation that went from space to space to space with um, this being the outcome of a year-long research project working with the John Latham Archive. Um, 
More recently, we worked with Ben Cain, who's work dealt with uh, event and time base. And most recently, the last exhibition was with Stina Marie Jakobsen, who worked with uh, young people in Peckham and Camberwell, teaching them law and getting them to rewrite UK law with professional lawyers uh, relating to UK stop and search law. And these are then being proposed to UK politicians uh, for suggested amendments to the law. So, sorry. Uh, yeah. I'll just come to an end. We, we also do a journal of John Latham's art and ideas called Noit. The next one's coming out in July. And it's written with Noah Latham, which is John Latham's son, a philosopher based in Calgary. So I, when I go home after this, I'll be doing more copy editing. Um, and I had a film that I wanted to show by Lord Provo, uh, which he made in the house. But I don't know if... Can I give it a go? <laughs> I don't know if the sound's connected, I hope so. That's it. Obviously it should be shown with sound. <laughs> but thank you very much.